delayed? Inevitable. Deep? Transition. Daily. Loss. Connection. Chaotic. Hope. Subconscious. Collaboration. How do you start? How do you start talking about grief? I don't know if I deal very well with it. Because it is a daily thing, right? And especially um, in the Indigenous community the past couple weeks with Tina Fontaine and the Bushi verdict and then Barb Kettner and then, um, you know, just this piling on diminishment of spirit through legal systems and non-guilty verdicts and feeling that in the community with the youth especially and um, having some students who are dropping out of thesis because they're feeling that, right? And then, um, yeah, how do I deal with that? Normally I want to get by a fire and bring the youth and community with me um, to access that good spiritual you know, way of letting go of grief, but it almost uh, seems to be a privilege in the city to be able to have a fire, right? Or, um, to be able to schedule that time for healing to be together. How do you deal with it? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think I deal with it well either, <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> in a way. I, I manage, for sure, um, the mornings especially, and try to, um, try to focus what I'm, I'm paying attention to, to the things that I think are most important, because it's such a, um, a barrage. Although having just said that, what's mo what's most important, right? It's it's really uh, challenging. Uh, but I think with you, because we both teach, right? And so we both like we're artists making work, but we're also going into this community of young people who are working to do what we do, you know. And uh, I find interestingly, I think I actually do find um, uh, strength and inspiration. Uh, going and working with those younger people, uh, like we were, we we do similar things. I think sometimes in class where we kind of open a space for conversation to happen. And I've noticed recently that one thing that we talk about a lot is sleep and rest, and people are exhausted. And so far, the conversation we've had, the conversations we've had, have been around. Um, uh, really practical things like like working two jobs and uh, you know um, commuting for four hours uh, and all those hard things. But I have a feeling it's also all of this, uh, all of these difficult, terrible things that are happening that every day. I mean, it takes something away uh, from you, and you've got to figure. We each individually and collectively have to figure out. In my, my experience is if I get involved with something or participate with a group, it helps. It makes a difference um, compared to just sitting there and trying to find solutions on your own. I mean, that's really hard. Yeah, groups are really important. I, um, I joined the Murdered Missing Indigenous um, Women's Group. It was actually called Murdered Missing um, Native Women's Group in the early 90s. And it was started by Amber O'Hara. And it was uh, online. Do you remember those listservs when the internet first came out? Mm -hmm. An online listserv. And we were looking um, at murdered, missing women all across Canada. And so daily, we were like inundated with new cases and, and the stories of trauma. And then like, Facebook still continues this today. Like I post about six or seven missing Indigenous women a day across Canada. And um, when I was in that group, though, I could only do it for two years. Like, so in order for me to recover, I had, I had to leave, 
and, and go into isolation a little bit. And so I didn't know how Amber O'Hara continued that, you know, and all of her research that she did was borrowed by the Sisters in Spirit campaign mm -hmm. afterwards. And um, yeah, she ended up dying at, at Casey House, and, but she had always such a good energy too. She had um, a lot of trauma, but she also had a lot of humor. And I think humor is a good strategy in, in dealing with grief. And you see a lot of indigenous comics and, and um, as a way to talk about difficult things, you know, through humor. But sometimes I have to leave the situation. So, like, it's good to be part of a group so that you know that you have um, people who are going through similarity and they have empathy. But then also, I think for me, I need to go into my inner self in order to heal and just like focus on my family and my daughter as priority because I find like I give too many of my colors away sometimes. And so I need to go home and regroup and then come back out, hopefully reinvigorated to, to work with that. Yeah. Do, do you find that, um, that part of going away and, and replenishing is also your art practice? So when you're making, you're, it's a time of reflection? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. I think most of my work was uh, in the early stages about healing. Yeah. yeah. You know, work in this subconscious way. And um, working in such a subconscious way without thought, I would end up cutting half my hair off out of like I would feel frustration frustration and I would say to myself well what do women do when they're frustrated you know the cut their hair off and then I'd make something out of there and but it's also a Anishinaabe um, act of grief you know if we have a loss we'll cut our hair off to let go of that weight of grief too um, yeah but I'm thankful I'm on the stage now where my work is not always about healing, right? And um, always, or about like colonialism or like this binary kind of opposition. It's going more towards um, scientific, indigenous science investigation. But yeah, my art has been used a lot for dealing with trauma and emotion. And not just of me, but of my mother and my grandmother and the ancestors before me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I, I remember the first body of work I made in the early 90s that I exhibited. And um, at the time, my younger brother was very ill. He had uh, diabetes for quite an extended period of time. And then it all started to break down. And uh, I, I had reached a point, I was making paintings. And I was frustrated by the, I was making observational paintings, portraits, and um, you know, like interiors with figures, because I really didn't know what to paint, right? Mm -hmm. And when I emptied out the, um, the images, I made a decision, I'm just gonna paint, and I, this was not in, with an intention of showing it at all, but just to have the experience of painting color on, on these fields, uh, and they were small. But I used the colors that I was using to paint portraits of, the people who were around me, including my brother. And as I started to do that, the, the fields, the surfaces started to get disrupted, basically. You know, And, and it, after a certain period of time, I brought these things together and realized what I had actually done, like, or what the work had kind of, like, you know, it's such a collaborative thing, it's even impossible to say what came first. But I ended up calling the, or, or making this piece that was really about his body breaking down, you know? So instead of a portrait of somebody where you could recognize the person, there were these panels in flesh colors. And I had built up like multiple colors behind. And then I would start to go back into them to reveal. It, it, it was super graphic. And it was the early 90s, and everything was about the body, right? So I was definitely influenced by the the work that I was seeing around me. But when I think about it in the context of today, I realized that it was a kind of form of grieving. In that case, it was pre-grieving. He died shortly after the exhibition, unfortunately. Um, but also, and I've talked about this with you and also in the context of this work a fair bit, um, that at the same time, I never sort of 
openly or consciously grieved for any of the deaths in my family that there wasn't really a mechanism for it. And you know, there, was a, there might have been a funeral or a, a, a memorial service or something, but then it was just like moving on, you know, no, no time, no, uh, no space essentially to, to be with that. Mm -hmm. Which I think happens a lot in this, you know, uh, in in like urban centers where we may not have, um, as in the same way as in the past, those kind of rituals, and that has its impact, right? Like not dealing with it manifests in so many different ways. When those happy accidents kind of happen, when you said that there was a degeneration of the paint that was reflective of a degeneration of the body reminded me of um, Mama Tuisawin and how through those creative acts, new knowledge comes to us through things like happy accidents. Like one time I was showing a youth workshop how to do a Jane Ash Portras kind of style with the layering of acrylic glazes and acrylic paints and varnishes. And I was using a picture of Sitting Bull and I was talking at the same time about this concept of the ancestors helping you in creative process to give you new knowledge. And accidentally tobacco spilt into the varnish. Like I was going through my purse and loose tobacco fell on, under the picture of Sitting Bull. And I said, oh, see, <laughs> Sitting Bull's telling me I have to give him tobacco before I do anything with his picture, right? You know, like to honor and to ask and have that reciprocal relationship even with the with the image of this great leader, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I was in the studio at number one Spadina, letting go of your thought process there and going into a subconscious thing was kind of really dangerous for me given the energy of that building and that space. And I was doing really freaky things in my artwork that I didn't want to do in my artwork. So I didn't end up working in that building the second year of my practice there. I remember one of, you, you went through that um, master visual studies program before I did, um, but by the time I was there, one of my co uh, colleagues uh, also uh, was very, felt the presence very um, viscerally. Yeah. And uh, she had an elder come from the center to uh, hold a feast for the dead, which we were able to participate in and it was really quite profound and I can say w without a doubt that the few weeks following that event felt very different in the building mm -hmm. smelled different which mm -hmm. I mean that I don't even I can't understand that even because that building was so old and mm -hmm. and, and just like uh, saturated like with, formaldehyde with formaldehyde, like formaldehyde and everything like all kinds of stuff but um, it, it had an impact for mm -hmm. sure uh, for, for a period of time anyway, mm -hmm. but I, I, my impression is there's so much going on that you're not gonna solve it with one, uh, you know, one ceremony. Oh, I had a really interesting uh, thought in that building because um, the, that building uh, also at one point housed the, um, s the laboratories of uh, Banting and Best. Mm -hmm. They did some of the research around uh, insulin there. Mm -hmm. And one day I was sitting there working and thinking, and you know, because my father died uh, in 1969 when he was 33 from insulin, uh, or sorry, from diabetes. But I realized that if they hadn't invented insulin, then he would have died when he was 13 or 14, right? So that medication that they developed through like terrible, terrible means, right, uh, kept him alive long enough to father, me, and my brothers. Like, it's a pretty interest, and then to be in that space making work, you know? There was something very, uh, I, I don't even know how to, to name it because it's, it's not like it's a good thought because it's so com conflicted, right? Like, it's so loaded with, with uh, problematics. But at the same time, it was kind of a, it made me make, take a minute to, to be grateful, you know, for that, uh, for that, research, which even though we know, you know what it took. That's the thing about life, though, that balance that, that um, we call Bamatsuin, like there's like an equal amount of you know, negative and positive that keeps the world balanced, right? Like that negative means by which they discovered that positive medicine.
I saw our, our similarity right away, even though I didn't, we didn't, we weren't aware of each other's work at all, right? right. But you know, my interest in string theory, I, I totally read, like how could you not read quantum entanglements with these pieces, right? And the need to, like, I read the grandfathers as the need to ground myself when, when looking at, or we, when deconstructing that epistemological thought on um, the creation of the universe, right? This piece. And um, are you talking about the stones when you say the grandfathers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Sorry. No, that's, is that like, um, is that a, a term? Uh, yeah, grandfathers or grandmothers, because normally, um, when you're looking for material on the planet that's the oldest material to work with, it's a stone, right? So it contains a lot of memory, so it has a lot of wisdom. But then when I was looking at creating uh, the work that has to do with creation, it came from a random happening, like that subconscious kind of random happening, where I got a lot of electrical feedback on the uh, old school monitor. I was like, oh, this is cool, what is it? And then I researched that the static electricity on your TV or on your radio is leftover radiation from the Big Bang and it took 14 billion years to get there. So then when we're looking at material that holds a lot of memory, yes, the grandfathers, but static. We have to show these two things we do. in proximity mm -hmm. somehow, because uh, for sure I was uh, I came to the stones because of the the, the miracle mm -hmm. of the fact that they are here and they yet were you know have been here for unknown like for me unknown. See, I knew it. Yes, but that also that the, that that. Um, right beside it, that there's this completely non-material, weightless thing, static, that contains the same, right? Mm. So, so it's kind of like the, the heavy weighted physical material and then the e ethereal, ephemeral of electricity, of light mm. protons, of you know, reflection and it's so interesting that those two things can speak to each other in, in, or, or almost like reflections of each other. Yeah, pretty cool. I think water is the same too. As the water you're drinking right now is also drank by dinosaurs, drunk by dinosaurs, right? And how it, that cycle is continually being renewed and, and how water came to the planet at the time of creation too from a meteor from somewhere, right? So water is also very ancient, you know? And I, I feel that like really ancient wisdom in all of your work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only because I shut up and get out of the way, honestly, uh, right? I feel like for me, I think part of my job is to shut up and get out of the way and, and be there and bring things together. Uh, you know, and, and I do think and I read and all of those things, but the, the most important thing is to listen. I think of, like when I look at your works, I think of things like the Einstein-Rosen bridge, right? Have you heard? Kind of, tell me. Yeah, <laughs> so Einstein and Rosen um, propose the theory of the opposite end of the black hole, that you can go through a black hole. I remember we, there was NASA just published a picture of something coming out of a black hole, right? So it kind of looks like um, the images for this theory, it looks like two funnels um, put together. So it's like going into the black hole and then out the other side, which is portholes, right? Which is um, the places of where you can jump between those multiple dimensions. And according to string theory, there's like 11 dimensions right now, right? But your work is kind of like those portals. Like if you look at the, the drawn images on the computer and when you're doing research into Einstein-Rosen bridge, it is it's very similar, right? And um, I feel like your work is also doorways and, you know, to the spiritual, spiritual realm, and, um, which is really appropriate considering that a lot of your work is speaking about death, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or as Tim Whiten, we, we had, had well, you were there at the panel discussion, mm -hmm. and Tim Whiten said, "There is no death," <laughs> which yeah. which I found really interesting because yeah. 
I mean, we again, this is where language, we use language in order to be able to kind of navigate through these really complex things. But the word that jumped out that, that really almost like um, consolidated this work, aperon, right? What's that mean? So the, the aperon is a term that was coined by Anaximander, who was one of the ancient Greek philosophers. Apparently, the um, earliest recorded. So they don't have a lot that he wrote, but there are these pieces of information. One of them is this term that he came up with to describe the substance from which all life emerges and all life returns to. Mm. Uh, and this is somebody mm. sitting there kind of going, where are we from and where do we go, right? Mm. The eternal question, the, the eternal question. And so it really resonated for me um, because I had this, this black wax and I wanted to make something really um, permeable and open and large, like really uh, something that would, we could immerse ourselves in or at least confront in a more sort of massive way. And uh, as I worked on it, it flipped back and forth between being a substance and a place, right? So you, what you just said about the black hole is, it could be his Aperon, right? Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? But, what, but I mean, what, I don't read a lot of science uh, texts, but what I do find out about on news and so on always really intrigues me because I feel like in the last 25 years, more and more, the discoveries are supporting, yeah. uh, right? Like thing, like indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. that has always been there, um, which there's a kind of an irony that it needs to be validated by science. But if that's what it takes mm -hmm. for us to actually start to um, respect and value more, uh, mm -hmm. these alternative ways of knowing or, and they're not alternative, like all the language is so unsatisfactory, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I like um, what Witten said about there is no death. Thank you for reminding me about that. It's just transition, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and through those, through those doorways, like when we talk of somebody passing, they've gone through a Western doorway, mm -hmm. we say. And um, I've been taught we are made of stardust. And it kind of sounds like a New Age thing, but that's because New Age is appropriating indigenous ways of thought, right? Um, and I think it's kind of bullshit, excuse my language, that it takes, you know, Western science, or to be really blunt, a white guy, to say what we've been saying for thousands of years for people to believe it, but unfortunately, that's the truth, right? Um, that people will be more apt to believe it if it's from a white male as opposed to another. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of, um, the early alchemists believed it. The early alchemists believed in the sentience, um, in the consciousness of elements, right? And that's why and they collected the morning dew, right? So I was reading this book, it's Natural Magic, and it was written, it's published by the Gutenberg Press and written in the 1500s all early alchemists, I'm like, this is really like indigenous thought, you know? And then there is a separation of that consciousness and that spirit in science that I think now is just coming back. Yeah, it's yeah. coming together more now. Yeah, and I'm glad for that because I think, um, you know, people have forgotten in the West that we are like all the Earth's descendants, right? And I think prior to Christianity, we all had a land-based spirituality. And I think um, through Eurocentric diffusionism, like internationally, that there is this loss of connect to the land. And, um, you know, it's, Eurocentricism has become such like a global project that people are not really feeling um, individual anymore. Or um, there, there's just a loss. There's like that groundedness isn't there anymore. So my thought as a teacher is to try and get students to go back as far as they can, hopefully, possibly, in terms of ancestry and territory to recover what colonial strategy or, you know, try to deny them. Because that all happened in the West first, right? And um, we all need, as John Trudell says, as humans, um, enact our responsibility, which is to the mother, which is to the planet. You know, but a lot of people have been separated from that relationship to the earth. And 
even though your work is like so universal, it is also really grounding. Yeah. yeah I know I miss that. I, I feel very disconnected in that way, for sure. But your art doesn't seem to be disconnected at all. But discon I mean disconnected from, uh, from physical contact. I mean, it's just literally living in the city and not, you know, m making time, finding ways to go out and be, you know, next to water and, and have access to the sky. I mean, it, it's kind of feeble, but I literally every night before I go to sleep, when it's not minus 25, uh, I have a little step outside balcony, right? And I step out and I look up, and in downtown Toronto, if on a good night, I can see five or six stars, mm -hmm. which strikes me as kind of incredible, actually, that I can see anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm drawn to that. Like, or if it's a full moon, I have to go out and spend a few minutes with it, right? I know, no, you really, uh, you, you often post about the full moon when it's happening. It's usually how I know it's a full moon is because Dan has posted on Facebook about it. But it's a, it, it draws you too. Yeah. Well, I was saying how people forget their connection to land, but we can never not be connected to land, right? So even if we're in an urban center, even if it's the water that you're using when you're brushing your teeth or having a drink, that's... Uh, a spiritual element that we're ingesting and having a relationship with. Even the concrete. There's an article that's called um, The Pedi Pedagogy of Place, but it's all about uh, in an urban environment. And it reminds you that, yes, while it is a privilege to be able to go out of the bush and to access this beautiful landscape and feel at one with nature, it's such a privilege, right? Um, but you can also do that in the city, you know, that there are ways, like on your back porch, going to look at the star, you know? Yeah. They're more special that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you get that sense of wonder in your work too. It's like each one of these are looking in the, looking for a star kind of thing in your paintings.